I'm Dr. Anthony Cave, a Stanford and Harvard trained anesthesiologist and integrative medicine specialist. Many patients come to me who have been struggling to heal from depression, anxiety, PTSD, chronic pain. They've been stuck in loops for years, unable to pull themselves out, no matter what medications they've tried. Some of those medications have had side effects and others flat out haven't worked. And they hear about a new medication that can help them address the root cause of their suffering, whether it be depression, anxiety, or something else. And they're very excited to explore this new therapy that can help them reduce their reliance on other medications, only to find out that insurance doesn't cover it. If you heard of ketamine, you know this story. Even though ketamine, like many of the medications that we use in the operating room every day, has been around for decades. In fact, ketamine has been around for over 50 years, and yet it's still an out-of-pocket cost for patients. What is this secret that the pharmaceutical industry is using that can be used for good, powerful innovation, but also to hinder access to these powerful medications and therapies for my patients? And why doesn't ketamine get FDA approval so it's no longer an off-label use for these mental health conditions? Simply put, it's really expensive and you can't put a patent on an old medication. Well, actually you kind of can. They're called patent extenders, but it can't just use the same exact old medication. Here are the four tricks that Big Pharma uses to get across that problem and why they've tried it for ketamine and it doesn't really help patients in the long run. Medicine's greatest secret is our inner healing potential and it's most powerful under anesthesia. When we let go of the reality, we think we know. Ketamine was originally approved by the FDA for use in anesthetic-like situations, like in an operating room here, to facilitate placing breathing tubes like this one or to undergo medical procedures. More recently, ketamine has been used, quote, off-label for other indications like depression, anxiety, and the other conditions I mentioned earlier, and I have many videos on what some of those conditions are and how ketamine is fundamentally different than all those other typical types of psychiatric medications. But this is still what's called an off-label use. Off-label use sounds really scary, but in reality, the majority of the medications that we use in medicine, especially in critical care settings, like what we use in surgery. Just look at what we have here. Propofol is a powerful anesthetic, often used for off-label purposes. Dexamethasone, a powerful steroid, often used in quote, off-label circumstances. Reglan, Zofran, so many medications are powerful and effective and safe, but haven't been studied through the way that the FDA requires to get their badge of approval. Since ketamine is still used off-label for depression, anxiety, and these other conditions, insurance companies are very hesitant to reimburse for these therapies, even though they're very, very effective and safe. So what's the problem with FDA approval? Who cares if it's FDA approved if the medication works? The problem is that as soon as something is generic, meaning that anyone can produce it, pharmaceutical companies can't charge high prices because of supply and demand. There's no longer protection for producing that medication from their previous patent. So those medications that I showed you earlier in the anesthesia cart are often generic and are much cheaper than they were when they first came out. Who is gonna put the money into these studies to get that official FDA approval if they can't make money off of selling the 50-year-old generic medication. So the problem is that pharmaceutical companies have an incentive to keep making new medications so that they can have what's called a patent extension to breathe new life into their medications. The problem is that making new medications is very, very expensive and applying for the FDA approval process is also very expensive. So the safest bet 
is to take old medications that we know work very well and make minor modifications and slap those through the FDA approval process so that we can get new patents for making them so that we can continue to make profits off of older medications. If this sounds messed up to you, well, it kind of is. These incentives are perverse, or what we call perverse incentives, because pharmaceutical companies are incentivized to make minor changes to old medications and repatent them. We call them Me Too drugs. This is the first way that you need to know that pharmaceutical companies continue to generate large profits, sometimes with minimal innovation. I'm not saying pharmaceutical companies are all bad. There are powerful, powerful drivers of innovation in many cases, not always in Me Too drugs. And it's not subtle, these tricks that they play. You need to look at the chemical or the generic name, not the brand name, because it's covered up. Look at ketamine, for example. I told you that ketamine is over 50 years old and has been off patent for a long time, and that's why it's relatively cheap compared to brand name medications like Spravato. Spravato is the intranasal form of ketamine, and notice how Spravato completely hides the fact that it's just plain old ketamine, but one form of ketamine that's been extracted from the age-old ketamine. It's called an isomer. It's the same molecule, but modified in a slight way to grant it a new chemical name and a new brand name that facilitates it being approved and having a patent extension. That's ketamine versus S-ketamine. That S refers to the minor modification that's made from the what's called racemic ketamine to help give it that patent extension. Racemic means that it has all the different forms of the ketamine. The S ketamine is referring to one type of ketamine that's extracted from that racemic mixture of ketamine. I don't mean to bring up high school chemistry, but that's all this trick really is. And it's not just with ketamine and S ketamine. Look at other really common medications like proton pump inhibitors for acid reflux which, by the way, are some of the most prescribed medications in the planet. A common one is omeprazole, called Prilosec. But when Prilosec was going off patent, they made S-omeprazole. So that's omeprazole versus S-omeprazole. Largely the same molecule, but extracting one subtype of the original omeprazole. But they gave it the name Nexium, to completely hide the fact that, hey, this is just a minor modification of the original Prilosec. But they were able to generate profits from having a new patent on this new Me Too medication. Antidepressants are also very commonly prescribed worldwide, and this same trick is applied there. Look at Citalopram versus S-Citalopram. That's Celexa versus Lexapro. But if you just look at the brand name, you would never know that they're that closely related. And how about allergy medications? Also very, very widely used, cetirizine versus levocetirizine. But the brand names Zyrtec and Zyzal don't make that connection as obvious as their chemical or generic names. Number two are the delivery routes of medications. Ketamine was traditionally given intravenously or with an intramuscular shot. It's called a ketamine dart. I've talked about it in other videos. We often use it in pediatric patients who can't tolerate an IV in the operating room or the emergency room. However, S-ketamine or Spravato is an intranasal spray. So that's a different route of delivery, which also helps justify its case of being given a patent extender, in addition to being an isomer of the racemic ketamine that we've been using for 50 plus years. You hear similar tricks all the time in drug ads. Have you ever heard of sustained release versus immediate release, or sublingual versus a tablet or capsule versus a shot? These are all similar tricks that sometimes are powerful, but other times are used to justify a new medication or a new route of delivery to get more patent life out of an old medication. Number three are the indications that you're trying to get FDA approval for. Like I told you earlier, ketamine was specifically approved for certain anesthetic indications, and then it began to branch out into other fields. The same goes for many other medications. Just look at medications for acid reflux. 
Initially, the proton pump inhibitors were primarily indicated for gastroesophageal reflux disorder, what we call GERD. But later versions of very similar Me2 proton pump inhibitors, taking different isomers, for example, like the Prilosec vs. Nexium, began to get indications for erosive esophagitis. Now, erosive esophagitis likely has the same etiology or the same root cause of gastroesophageal reflux disorder, or GERD, but having it FDA approved for a new indication, even if it's kind of similar to the old indication, further justifies its use of having a new patent. And the same would be required for racemic ketamine to gain FDA approval for depression, anxiety, and the other off-label uses. But once again, who is going to put the money into these studies to get that official FDA approval if they can't make money off of selling the 50-year-old generic medication? And number four, and this is really important, this is that insurance rarely covers holistic therapies. Now, ketamine itself is very powerful. However, it's no silver bullet. In fact, you should watch my recent video talking about ketamine scams and just how prevalent scams are that just inject patients with ketamine, helping them feel better for a short period of time, then get them stuck in a loop of getting booster sessions. Mental health requires so much integrative and holistic treatment if we want to address the root cause. It's not too different than heart disease, where we can also push medications for cholesterol and blood pressure without addressing the root cause of heart disease, which are often, not always, lifestyle modifiable factors that need a holistic treatment model to be addressed. Mental health is even more important sometimes because depression, anxiety, and other conditions aren't just a neurochemical imbalance in most, not all, patients. The Western biomedical model reduces us to a bunch of serotonin and glutamate and norepinephrine around the brain. Yes, this is powerful for a mechanistic understanding of how the brain works, but it's not powerful to look at a holistic view of a patient who's been suffering for years struggling to find a way to heal from these debilitating conditions. This is where ketamine, when used responsibly and ethically, can have a transformative effect. But insurance rarely covers holistic treatments. It's far more likely to cover pushing pills or injections or one-off infusions. Unfortunately, that's a reality of the Western medical system that most of us live in here in the United States. There you have it. Four reasons why insurance doesn't cover ketamine and probably won't cover a holistic healing model with any psychedelics in the future. But what do you think? Have you found healing through the traditional roots of using ketamine or other psychedelics? Let me know below and I would love to hear your opinions on how we can fix this problem.